Hey, 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 everybody. This is Crystal O'Connor from Bullet Talk Radio. It is so good to be behind the mic talking to you for another week, another episode, episode two. So next week will be episode three. And between now and then, a certain little holiday will be happening, Christmas. So I'm just going to start this off by saying a very merry, happy, and safe Christmas to you and yours. And no drunk driving and no arguing about politics with your family because it won't get you anywhere good, right? At least it doesn't with me. (laughs) So just throwing that out there, it's more safe if we all just avoid the politic conversation this Christmas. Right. So the gun industry, once again, has not failed me in providing me numerous, numerous articles and topics worth discussing this week. So why don't we just jump right into it with the Virginia governor seeking to reinstate restrictions on handgun sales. Yes, Governor McAuliffe is requesting a reinstatement of restrictions on handgun purchases one handgun a month somebody please tell me what that actually does what what good does that actually do anyway that was repealed in virginia during his republican predecessor's administration he also wants to require private vendors at gun shows running background checks. He wants to revoke concealed weapons permits for parents who are delinquent on child support payments And he wants to prohibit possession of firearms for misdemeanor domestic violence offenders. So if you are in Virginia, go take a look at the bills that are being introduced. And if you have a problem with it, write to your house, write to your Senate and let them know. Next up on the list, student who fights for college students rights to self-defense is shot on campus. So Nathan Scott, a student at Florida State University, Tallahassee, works the school library and is a member of Students for Concealed Carry at the university. The group has lobbied for years to get the ban on lawful concealed carry lifted. However, on November 20th, he was shot while working at the library by a disturbed former student with paranoid delusions who opened fire with a pistol at the library's front door. Nathan, as well as an Army Combat Infantry veteran, both had to take cover. However, both were well-trained, skilled, and could have had the opportunity to end the attack had either one of them been granted their Second Amendment rights on campus. The shooter we now know was mentally ill. However, he had not been treated, not been involuntarily committed, his friends and family didn't know, even Facebook posts didn't lead hints. Therefore, the shooter was perfectly legal to purchase a firearm. Background checks here did nothing. However, gun control regulations certainly prevented the victims in this case from defending themselves. I went to college. I went to college twice. Well, the first time I went, I was too young and dumb. And frankly, I wasn't old enough, at least in my state, to have a concealed firearm. So it wasn't really something that I thought about. So I actually couldn't tell you if that school had a rule on it or not. But the second time around, I went to a Catholic university. And at that point, I did have my Pennsylvania license to carry concealed permit. And I did have uh, my first concealed carry gun, which I still own. That's my my CZ75 compact that I did the review on earlier this year. And they did have regulations stating that I was not permitted to carry concealed on campus. Uh, I don't go there anymore. So, and I haven't mentioned the name of the university either. So I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Concealed means concealed. And in my case, I already had my degree. I was well into my career. I was there to advance my degree, but I... To me, if I'd have been kicked out, I'd have been kicked out. I I thought long and hard about that decision. But that university was right across the street from a very bad area of town. And that just was not a risk I was willing to take. 
Um, so I really applaud these, these groups, these students for concealed carries that are popping up at the many different colleges and universities across the country. Moving right along then, in Connecticut, an attorney states that states' seizures of guns could be unconstitutional. So attorney Rachel Baird, and I may have said that wrong, I'm not good at pronouncing names, I swear I butcher everybody's names, but anyway, she says she, quote, intends to take the issue to the state's Criminal Justice Policy Commission. So the issue here is that seizure warrants are in her words, in fact, executed at the evidence rooms of police stations rather than at the individual's homes. So a friend, family member, neighbor, someone who just doesn't like you and has a vendetta happens to call the police and says that you are a threat to public safety or you are suicidal. Police come to your home, say, we're taking your guns. Do you have a warrant? Nope, doesn't matter. I'm taking your guns. They take your guns. They go back to the station. They go to the evidence lockup. And that's where they actually call the judge and acquire the warrant. So they've already seized your weapons without even having a warrant. This is a 15-year-old statute. 180 seizures were approved in 2013. 1,000 in the 15 years since the legislation was passed. Under the terms of the law, neighbors, friends, and family members can notify police when they think someone has access to guns and is a public safety threat or suicidal. Teen shoots intruder trying to protect grandmother. 14-year-old was ill, not feeling very well. Grandmother had just had hip surgery. So the teenager went to visit his grandmother, was helping her. She was helping him, you know, all of that jazz. And the back window of the house was broken in. The teenager told the intruder to stop. The intruder did not. The 14-year-old then proceeded to shoot him with the pistol that was in the house. Police are counting the shooting as justified. The teenager is not new to the world of intruders. Unfortunately, the teenager lost his father in 2008. His father was shot during a robbery of his auto shop back in uh, 2008. So I'm really glad that the teenager did what needed to be done to stop the intruder, saved his grandmother, saved himself. But boy, that's that's a mind job. So I really I really feel for him. So uh, prayers, good thoughts, good vibes out to that family. But good guy with a gun in this case stopped a bad guy with a gun. Here's an odd one that came across my desk, or at least I think it's odd. I'm not sure I'm understanding the arguments for this. But H.R. 5344 in... Uh, our current Congress, Responsible Body Armor Possession Act. (laughs) Yes, you heard that right. Responsible Body Armor Possession Act. This bill was referred to the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, Homeland Security and Investigations on 9-26-2014. It provides for a ban on purchase, ownership, or possession of enhanced body armor by civilians with exceptions. The exceptions include if bought by or with the authority of the United States or department or agency of the United States, or if it is bought or with the authority of a state or department agency or political subdivision of a state, or if it was lawfully possessed by any person at any time before the date the law takes effect. So you are grandfathered. If you already happen to own a piece of armor that falls under their definition of enhanced body armor and this law passes, well, you can hang on to your armor. It's your grandfathered in. Otherwise, unless Big Brother tells you that you're allowed to have it, you can't have it. Enhanced body armor is defined as... Body armor, including a helmet or shield, the ballistic resistance of which meets or exceeds the ballistic performance of type 3 armor determined using National Institute of Justice Standard 0101.06. The penalties are fines and imprisonment of not more than 10 years or both. The 6th District Federal Court rules in favor of plaintiff regarding access to Second Amendment 
after a single incident, involuntary commitment. Okay, so I will have a link to the judgment PDF. I went straight to the source on this one because some of the sites I found out about it from, uh, I'm a little leery about their sources sometimes. So I went straight to the source and pulled the PDF and, and read the document. And it's actually a very interesting read. So go check the show notes after the show, whenever you have a moment, download the PDF to your tablet or whatever, a little nighttime reading, a little glass of wine, you know, it really is, um, very interesting reading as to how they got to the decision that they got to. But okay, so you have Mr. Clifford Tyler, who is the plaintiff, and you have the Hillsdale County Sheriff's Department, who's the defendant. And I'll just read you the um, top paragraph that explains in very short order what this is from the circuit judge. This case presents an important issue of first impression in the federal courts, whether a prohibition on the possession of firearms by a person who has been committed to a mental institution, 18 U.S.C. 922 G4, violates the Second Amendment. 28 years ago, Mr. Clifford Childs, Charles Tyler was involuntarily committed for less than one month after allegedly undergoing an emotionally devastating divorce. Consequently, he can never possess a firearm. Tyler filed suit in federal court seeking a declaratory judgment that 922 G4 is unconstitutional as applied to him. The district court dismissed Tyler's suit for failure to state a claim because Tyler's complaint validly states a violation of the Second Amendment. We reverse and remand. This question, the question of mental health and firearms comes up pretty frequently. And a lot of the shootings that we see, I mean, one of the stories I read today came from somebody who was mentally ill, although he was not yet diagnosed as mentally ill. But honestly, people have bad times in life. Sometimes really, really bad things happen. You kind of break a little bit, or maybe you break a lot. You go through a very, very difficult divorce. I watched a very close family member go through two divorces in her lifetime. And let me tell you something, that can get really ugly really fast. And it can bring a person really far down. Or the loss of a child. I have a three and a half year old. And if I ever lost him, uh, I, I really can't even begin to tell you what that would be like. And I actually, again, have somebody very close to me in my family who lost his daughter when she was three. And I met him after the fact, but honestly, I can sit here and tell you it affects him every single day. And I don't think, I don't think he's the same person that he was before he lost her. Bad times in life happen and and all of us go through bouts of depression, some more difficult than others, some more deeply than others. And we all handle it in different ways. Some people internalize, some people put it out there on others. Some people turn to drugs. Some people turn to alcohol. Some people hide in their rooms and sleep all day. You know, everybody handles it a bit differently. And sometimes you become involuntarily committed because you may feel at that time that suicide is your only way out. As was in this case, where this gentleman was involuntarily committed. He was going through a really rough patch in his life and he was involuntarily committed, but he was rehabilitated. He is well now. He's a stable, perfectly fine gentleman in society. And you can read in the brief, they go through the whole, the whole case. They explain his entire situation. So you can read and see that, yes, he is a perfectly fine person in society. So should he be denied his second amendment rights because he had a really bad rough spell one year? If you go through a really difficult time in life, and maybe you don't quite go that far, but maybe you go to your doctor and you say, hey doc, you know, I'm just, I'm not feeling well. I'm really anxious or I just, I feel depressed. You know, maybe you're not really thinking about suicide. You're not quite there, but you just, you've got something bottled up or that bubble in your chest. 
And that doctor prescribes you a medication to help you kind of even things out for a little while. Maybe you're only on that medication for a month or a couple months, just enough to get you, give you that push. Or maybe you're on it a little bit longer. That's okay. So now the federal government is getting involved in our health care. And they see that you've been prescribed that medication. Are you at some point now going to be listed as mentally unstable enough to not have access to your Second Amendment rights? Some people might say I'm a little crazy for suggesting that. But these are issues that have hit close to home in my world, either for myself or very close people that I know. And that's a big issue. Think about it and read this decision. It's a really good read. These judges really laid it out well. I completely concur with their decision. I really wanted to take a moment and really spend some time to talk about this decision because as soon as it came across my desk, I was like, wow. And more good news, hailing out of Arizona, Martha McSally was declared winner of Arizona's Congressional District 2 seat Wednesday after a recount. That was Gabriella Gifford's seat, the one who was shot and wounded, quite unfortunately, in January of 2011. After she was shot and wounded and she started to recover, she and her husband came out vehemently anti-gun and really, really went after the Second Amendment. Well, obviously, she's not serving anymore. Someone who worked in her office had taken over And, well, that seat is now passed over to Martha McSally, who is a very pro-gun Republican candidate. So, good job, Arizona, on a recount, no less. Texas is considering allowing open carry. Did you know Texas bans open carry? I'm always surprised how many people don't realize that, that even in Pennsylvania, we allow open carry, but not in gun-toting state Texas. So many people think that Texas is like the Wild West, that they are so pro-gun, and they are so pro-gun. But alas, there is a 140-year-long ban on open carry for pistols. This could change in 2015. Now, I don't want to get into the whole open carry, concealed carry debate in this episode. But what I will say is the problem with having a state actually not permit open carry, even for those of you who do concealed carry, is the issue of printing. Technically speaking, In a state that forbids open carry, if you are concealed carrying and you print and and it's possible to see, at least to someone who's educated, that there is a gun on your hip or wherever it might be, you can be in trouble because concealed really does mean concealed. Whereas in a state like Pennsylvania, yeah, I conceal carry most of the time. Most people I know do conceal carry most of the time. But if you happen to lean one way or your jacket brushes a certain way and the gun uh, might glint in the sun for a second or the pattern becomes a little clear, I mean, it happens to the best of us. At least you're covered under the law. So that's what I'll say about that. Yay, Texas. More pro-gun stuff. This next one is kind of a big question in my mind. And so I actually posted this one out to social media to get your thoughts. And boy, you folks were happy to oblige. This comes out of Jefferson City, Missouri. And the article that I used for this conversation is titled, Should Convicted Drug Dealers Have the Right to Carry Guns? So the backstory is a gentleman, Marcus Merritt, was convicted of a federal drug dealing felony in 1986 and charged in 2013 with additional drug crimes and violating Missouri's ban on felons possessing firearms. The argument is there is no compelling reason to ban all felons from possessing guns for life. Mr. Merritt is challenging what in court whether or not he should have access to his Second Amendment rights since the charges he had against him while felonies are technically non 
violent felonies. So before I get to where I sit on this, let me read some of the comments that I received on social. On Twitter, I heard from at Ron Goad, if he is the poster child with two drug charges, he is not a law-abiding citizen, and in my humble opinion, he is a risk. No exception. Also on Twitter, at Tazcat2011, yes, they should. Someone is either free or they are not. No provision for second-class citizens in the United States Constitution. And over on Google+, Plus, I heard from Thomas, who voiced his opinion, provided if no violence was involved, I say, let them have them. I, in some cases, domestic violence can be a misdemeanor depending on the leave of violence. Those people should be stripped of all their gun rights. So those of you who know me personally, who have discussed this topic with me, or those of you who listen to my take one <laughs> at this podcast know that I tend to float towards the constitu- constitutional carry camp, which means the Second Amendment is the Second Amendment, plain and simple. Of course, I feel that way about all of our amendments. I am of the camp that if you can be permitted to walk the streets as a free man, or woman, then you should have full access to your rights. If we are going to make the argument that these are God-given rights, or that they are laws of nature, that man should have access to, to these rights, then who are we to strip them from a person who we otherwise claim is a free man because he did his time. That said, I also feel that if your crime was so egregious so you can't be trusted with your rights, you should not be on the streets. So I kind of feel like this is not so much just a question of if you are a nonviolent felon, should you have access to your Second Amendment rights, but more a question of do we need an overhaul of our penal system? And I would say abso And the reason for that is because how many tax evaders are being holed up in federal prison? Now, you want to talk about the nonviolent crime. So the guy didn't pay the man. So he lost his job. Didn't pay the man. Or in Virginia, your governor is trying to do the whole not paying my child support. Now, I'm a mom. I believe wholeheartedly that my husband would would not leave me and I have to go through the whole child support thing. But I was a child of divorce. So I watched the whole child support thing. And I saw with people that I knew cases where child support wasn't always so forthcoming. Either it was because of a deadbeat parent or it was because they lost their job and they just didn't have the money. You know, you can't bleed dry what's not there, right? So do those people lose their Second Amendment rights? I don't really think so. But I also don't think that long-term jailing is necessarily the answer in those cases either. Or, and I know I'm probably going to take some heat for this, but you smoke a doobie, (laughs) you get caught, and how many hours of court time and how much time do you spend incarcerated while the pedophile keeps getting released from jail, while the guy who here in Pittsburgh shoots up three cops, how many times has he been arrested Arrested with firearms charges that get not not prosecuted. So he doesn't stay in jail. He keeps getting out. You think he's getting his guns legally? No, of course he's not. Now, those are violent felons that don't have access to their Second Amendment rights, technically. And look what they were able to accomplish. He should have still been in jail. A violent pedophile should still be in jail. So you escape your taxes once, twice. You're now a felon. You don't have access to your Second Amendment rights. 
if you are a drug dealer and you are a dangerous society, you should be in jail. So I look at this in two ways. If you are deemed capable to be a free man, then you're a free man. But I also feel that we need to take a really good, hard look at our criminal system and what cases aren't being prosecuted that should be and what criminals aren't being housed in jail that should be and what criminals are being housed in jail that probably could make room for one of those guys that really should be in jail. I think that's, I think that's what it really comes down to. You know, they say that these people are, are, well, we're releasing them from jail because we just don't have room in our jails and we don't have the money to support them. I think it's a bigger question. And I think once you get down to that point, the concept of you're a free man, therefore you're a free man becomes a little easier to answer. But thank you so much for, for your thoughts. Um, I really appreciate it. Beretta on their blog, blog blog.beretta.com, posted a fantastic blog post talking about improving your shot by accepting the wobble. All shooters have a wobble when shooting a pistol. Did you know it could be as large as two inches for a seasoned shooter? I didn't know that. I read that in this article. It's kind of cool. But uh, the article talks about how a gentleman was watching his buddy shoot and his buddy was shooting with a laser. Now his buddy is a really good shot. He, he knows what he's doing. He's very good at trigger control and all of that jazz. But this one day he's having a really difficult time. And it turns out that he was having a difficult time because you don't see the wobble as much when you aren't using a laser, but when you're using a laser, you see every single flinch and you're constantly trying to correct it. And then you jam the trigger back the second that laser pointer hits the center of the target, throws your shot off. It makes your wobble bigger. So you have to learn to accept your wobble. Anyway, guys, I thought this was a really great article, so I'm going to put it in the show notes. And if wobble is something that has ever frustrated with ever frustrated you go read this article it's some really really good advice and some news out of ruger they're releasing a new lc9s it's the lc9s pro it is virtually identical to his predecessor in every single way except there's no thumb safety, no magazine disconnect safety. Otherwise, it really is identical. Its size, its shape, its weight, everything is the same. It will even fit in the exact same holsters made for the LC9S. Really, the only difference is no thumb safety, no magazine disconnect safety. It's running about $449.00 comes with a soft case and a seven round magazine, a mag grip extension, and a cable lock. There will be a link to the guns and ammo article in the show notes. Next up, I wanted to talk to you about Project Child Safe. Now this came across my desk from a wonderful young lady who, boy, I really hope I could get her on the show sometime. Uh, Julie Golub. And she is on the Smith and, Smith and Wesson Shooters team. She is a world and nationally uh, renowned shooter. She is also a veteran of our military. She's just a really, really fantastic gal. So if you're not following her on Twitter, or Facebook, you you really need to uh, YouTube. She's got some good videos out there. She's just she's fantastic. I just I really really respect her. But anyway, so Project child safe accept donations from the public at large and with those donations they help to provide gun locks to um so-called the needy it's all about educating people and the community about safe gun handling and storage and if you don't if you have a gun and you don't have a gun safe or a gun lock these guys can help i know i said i'm for constitutional carry and i am but i also feel 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm going back to Spider-Man here, but with great power comes great responsibility. And that's absolutely true. And every single one of us who comes around a firearm at any given point in time in our lives, we have the absolute duty of handling those firearms safely and storing them safely. I have a three-year-old in this house. I carry a firearm. I have many safes in this house. And when my gun is not on me, it is locked up in a safe. It is our responsibility to teach others proper handling and proper storage. And to provide the opportunity to make proper storage a reality. And by keeping your firearm properly stored, it keeps little fingers out of the trigger. And it can help save lives. So, projectchildsafe.org, fantastic organization. Go give them a buck or two. Uh, read up about them. If you can't give them a buck or two, share them with your friends. Just share the website URL around your, your social media networks or you know talk about them to your buddies. Uh, contact your legislator. Or just take on the pledge that when you teach somebody about how to shoot, don't forget to talk about how to properly handle and store because it's so important. Okay, Truth About Guns gave us another quote of the day this week and I liked it. So I'm going to read it off to you. Supporters of gun control have sought to highlight the vast number of shootings that have occurred in recent years, but while it seemed to make sense, it may not have been a good strategy. They need to highlight examples where tough gun laws reduced shootings. Otherwise, such publicity may only reduce support for gun control. John A. Turris, do mass shootings like Newtown actually reduce support for gun control? So links to the original quote and to the truth about guns will be in the show notes. All right, folks, that's it for this week. So uh, if you are liking the show, please visit the website bullettalkradio.com and take a look at the show notes. Again, I always put links to all of this stuff in the show notes uh, so you can read a little more about what's talked about on the show. And again, if you like the show, do me a favor. If you are subscribing from iTunes, can you go into iTunes and leave a little review in the iTunes store? That would be really awesome. Or share out uh, the, the website or just talk about the show with your friends, post it out on social. That's a really great way to let me know you like what I'm doing and to get the word out about the show. And if you like it, of course, you would want to do that so that the show continues to grow, right? <laughs> if you're not already following on social and you are a social butterfly, visit me on Twitter at Bullet Talk Radio, Facebook.com slash Bullet Talk or plus.google.com slash Bullet Talk Radio. I would love to see, hear, or at least read your smiling faces and get involved in the conversation. Who knows? Your quote might get read on the show. Uh, also, if you go to bullettalkradio.com, there's a leave voicemail tab on the right hand side. You can click that and just using your phone's microphone or your computer's mic built in microphone, you can leave me audio feedback. And audio feedback's really cool because then I can hear you. So anyway, so many different ways to get in touch. Please, please do, because I love to hear from you. And if you like the show, uh, after a couple episodes, you're really digging it and you want it, you want to see it go places and do some things we talked about over in episode one, do visit my Patreon page, patreon.com slash bullet talk. And if you're, if you're in a position where you're willing to make a pledge, go right ahead. And um, as I said before, I will be 100% transparent with every donated dollar and exactly where it goes and what it's being used for. So uh, have a fantastic, safe, merry, merry Christmas. And... I will see you next week.